You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to a series called The Leadership Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ podcast and YouTube. Leadership in the justice system is about as challenging as it gets. Internationally, there are many different leadership roles, and at INCJ, we want to give people a conversational opportunity to explore what it's like to be a leader, just asking questions and seeing where the answers take us. Maybe you will find the answers stimulating in your role. If you want to follow the series, you'll find it on our website or on a YouTube or as a podcast at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCJ Network. The title of this podcast is Leading from the Outside Methods. Thank you for joining us and listening. This is the second podcast featuring today's guest, Bill Mather. The first session looked at the issues around working as an outsider in the criminal justice system. Bill shared aspects of his personal journey and insights. Now, today is about methodology, the how of leadership. Can you stimulate change from the outside? An introduction to Bill. He is currently working part-time as a consultant and is particularly interested in compliance. He is a non-executive director with Primary Care International. Bill's undertaken many international assignments for the EU and the UN, for example, as a program and project leader on criminal justice topics, often as a leader from the outside. Welcome to Bill Mather. Now, Thank Bill, you. tell us how is this session going to be different to the first one? Well, we're going to be looking at what it means to deliver consultancy internationally um, in the very different criminal justice system. Um, that means there's a methodology that I found really works. There are a number of things that absolutely uh, don't uh, in terms of sustainable change, um, which is, I think, our duty, is is not to be quickly in and out. Um, there's some tools that um, I'd like to highlight. Uh, and there's the whole issue about what is your role and relationship to your... Okay. Um, if we refer to uh, documents or materials, everybody, we'll, we'll make them available via the INCJ website in uh, uh, reference materials, which you'll hope will you'll find useful if you want to follow, follow anything up. But let's start by asking the question, what sort of consultant are you, Bill? I think there are three types of consultant. Um, two that I'm not is a technical consultant. So working from the outside um, isn't relevant to actually um, advising technically on the development of a good prison regime or better security systems or anything like that. So I don't do technical, even though I've worked with criminal justice organisations for decades. Um, I haven't been there and done that. The second area that I am not is a generalist, which is what you get from the, the big uh, consultancy services. They, they produce uh, off-the-shelf kind of frameworks and models and theories and so on. I'm a spoke um, consultant focused on two things, um, systems and for change. Um, so what I do know about is systems and change. Okay. So what would you say your key principles were? Well, I operate with um, four uh, ethics 
that become the, the principles. Um, I did a lot of research on this because I felt that one had to be able to explain oneself in a manner that was cross-culturally relevant. Um, so I, I came up with uh, looking at all the research about uh, human values and so on, four, um, and they spell life, which means I can remember them. Um, first, legitimacy means I'm... Um, Am I operating appropriately? Is this my uh, proper role and contribution um, compared with what the local um, professionals be doing and leading themselves? Secondly, integrity, for obvious reasons, but um, in terms of motivations and um, benefits that uh, you're looking for out of chain, uh, that's got a strong sense of integrity. Um, third one is freedom, uh, which means that your work should be releasing people to be able to innovate, contribute, uh, engage, um, be very um, participatory um, and, um, and own the, the, the process and uh, the product. So it's, uh, and quite a number of places you go to, there's no freedoms. They're very bureaucratic, they're very much uh, hierarchical. Um, uh, so that's uh, a guide for me about what I ought to be exploring uh, is happening through the processes that I introduce. And the last one is equity. Um, so that there is a real inclusive approach um, that doesn't um, uh, have exclusions of um, certain peoples or uh, doesn't particularly promote an elite uh, and so on. Those are my fighting things. Okay. So how do you set about winning the work in the first place? Well, uh, so I have a company, Social Pioneers, which is registered as an approved supplier with various UK government departments, including um, uh, International Development and Foreign Office. Um, and with the Commonwealth uh, and the other places where the commissioning of work um, takes place. Uh, largely, um, that's not a very fruitful. It, it does give you credential, shows you've got past a sort of benchmark. Um, it's down to um, personal and professional contact. And uh, I think that's the case for most uh, consultants uh, and recommendations from those you've already done work for. Um, but my line of work is feast or famine because I don't go in and out on short-term contracts. I go in for years of work. So, um, yeah, years of work uh, is a bit rare, uh, but that's what's needed to do strategy systems change. Um, you can't uh, be a quick in and out person for that. It sounds to me like you're qu quite against the uh, image of the normal consultant who's who does a quick three months in. Uh, does quite a lot of quick work and then leaves behind, uh, I'm not saying chaos, but leaves things behind, hoping that there's going to be a change. You're not that sort of an operator. I am totally against it. I don't think that there is um, a proper rationale 
around these kinds of assignments. Uh, so people who go in and do training um, for um, a different approach to a profession and do not address the system within which those people operate um, are just going to increase frustrations uh, and stress, frankly. Um, so the, the quick in and out isn't the systemic change that is often needed. Okay. So um, we talked a little bit about winning work, and that's um, often because of uh, relationships and trust you've already built up. How do you set about starting a project or a program? Um, right, you've got the contract. <laughs> then you think, oh, that what? <laughs> uh, firstly, contextualizing where you're going. And that's two things. It's one um, about international comparison. There's loads of international tables, um, everything from levels of trust through to human rights records. I mean, just everything's there. And so this country and the, the uh, customer in the country um, operating within th this um, situation, and uh, sometimes uh, it's quite... Um, and you need to know, therefore, what their um, expectation of improvements are going to be. The second thing is um, about cultural norms. So the norms of behaviours and beliefs, um, some of those are religious uh, um, traditions. Um, you need to know enough of that be able to properly um, uh, relate and to respect uh, the conditions that people are most comfortable with. You've got to always engage with people that, even though you may want to change some of that and move them on. Uh, so those two things... Uh, the third thing is, is to really check out the uh, international development organisation that have been present in the territory that you're going into for the long term, because they're going to be really helpful in gathering information about um, the politics of the small p, um, uh, as well as they'd expect you coming in to be consulting them, because uh, <laughs> this is their domain of influence. Uh, so there's those three things. Mm. I mean, it strikes me that you you do a lot of preparation. Um, some of it's intellectual, but quite a lot of it's cultural. Is that right? Yeah, it is. So um, I sometimes ask, for a cultural briefing from the sponsor. If I've not um, actually been in that, so um, going into an Arab culture, um, what do you actually uh, expect and how are you going to be respectful in your relationship? Um, so, one of the things in Arab culture is, is um, there's, there's a personal connection um, that needs to be made before you move into the professional work. Uh, another culture, ex-Soviet, um, it, it, it couldn't be more different. Um, it's very regimented, very... Um, structured, uh, completely uh, anti-my freedoms uh, principle, um, and people aren't actually encouraged 
to even talk to each other. It's really odd. But, I mean, I, I, sound, I sound a bit like I'm stereotyping, but the starting point is to enable people to make sense of your contribution. Otherwise, it's not going to go anywhere. That means you have to understand their perspectives and norms. Mm. When you arrive uh, to start up a, a project or a program, uh, generally you've been the leader, haven't you? So you've um, uh, got to engage with uh, a team. Uh, how do you establish your role as a leader in a new team? Well, um I mean, that's a good question. Uh, the, there are two forms of teams. One is very largely um, brought in from international networks, and the other is very largely local um, professionals and individuals. Um, in both cases, English is the language, otherwise... Um, communication be a bit problematic. Um, in the first case, uh, which is where you're uh, basically a, an international network uh, um, and uh, you're channeling in the kind of expertise that uh, unfolding, um, one has to get everyone up to speed uh, as they come in uh, to feel that they are not in a strange land and, and position. So they got to feel something that uh, gives them confidence and uh, the right signal to uh, be able to... Um, uh, so... You build up a team who actually um, slowly create a local uh, kind of tuning. Um, where you're dealing with locals, uh, then you really, really got to put them in charge of them as much as possible, because that's the best model. And so you delegate and evolve and um, kind of get them to bond uh, in a way that they become a dynamic that they haven't possibly previously experienced because they've often worked for big international uh, like UNDP um, and others that actually have more uh, regimented uh, institutional um, processes, whereas the teams that I create and lead have got to be uh, much more flexible, adaptable, dynamic, uh, and orientated towards skills and capabilities of the people who come to So... What I'm getting the feel of is that part of your engagement when you arrive is not to be hierarchical and to um, seek out where the skills are, both within the uh, the local um, team which has been built or you're building, and also where the expertise is coming from international quarters. Yes, and what you're constantly doing is... Um, adjusting that skill mix according to the demands that unfold from uh, the customer. And some of that adjustment means that you've got to embed it in your team and some of it is you, you, you need it to come in for the moments when when that particular uh, contribution is is needed. So an example of that is setting up um, the, the change management process. Um, and if you've got uh, the go ahead to set up a a change office inside a 
department, for instance, um, then th there are steps of training and guidance and systems development very specific to management um, that have got to be integrated into that government department. But it's only a, it's a phase of the development. You don't need it in the team all the time. Mm. Okay, I want to ask a little bit about the challenge of being the outsider doing this, because um, uh, you you know about systems and you know about change, um, but uh, in a way, people and systems can end up being pulling in different directions, and particularly if you're trying to run a, a change program, are people or systems more important to you? Do you think? Um. I find that, that you can't put one before the other because what you are needing to uh, facilitate is a change in performance. And that will often mean a change in aspirations of where the uh, organisation will get to. And that must mean changing to systems, change systems, change behaviors. So the systems will include standards, uh, performance measures, um, all sorts of triggers that actually determine how people behave. What you're trying to do is get from people where they want to get the change uh, to. Uh, and then help them des design a system that's going to facilitate that. Uh, so I, I can't quite either ahead or the other. Yes, but there's a, there is a danger, isn't it, that, that certain people's styles um, tend one way or another. They're either relational or systems people. Uh, and you're, what you're saying is that you have to hold them in tension all the time. You absolutely do. What you're trying to do, if it's going to be of significance, you'll be changing um, the culture, the behaviours, mindset. Um, it's big stuff, uh, and it doesn't happen overnight. But uh, what I find is that once you start giving the freedoms to people, and you give them platform and you enable uh, a listening process so that they have influence. You've got a real rich uh, uh, field of, of knowledge, of wisdom, of uh, caring, um, of uh, wanting to be proud in what they do, wanting a public respect. And all you know, wonderful stuff to work with. Um, and uh, there was an occasion where uh, we were working with a group in Kazakhstan um, uh, on the fleet uh, reform of the um, prostitution service, and they all found. The rules that I was bringing in uh, were about no uniforms. Everyone's got a uniform in the Soviet world, as far as I can tell. Uh, and no ranking. Every idea from every individual has to be heard and respected and, and so on. And uh, sitting around in a semicircle, so that there aren't um, people at the front and people. Everyone is, is there. And it, these techniques um, were very strange to them. And they got to enjoy it. Absolutely. Instead of just looking worried, they looked happy. They were coming in for one of these occasions. But it worried the boss, the big chief, 
one day um, a woman turned up who we didn't know who she was, where she come from, why she was there, and she refused to be part of the semicircle that on the outside. It later materialized that she was a psychologist sent in to see what we were doing with the minds of people in that semicircle. Um, and over time, she actually became involved. She got into the semicircle and she enjoyed herself and didn't feel that um, there was uh, any mischief going on and that she was in a position that, of a, a safe environment. Um, so you, you're shifting how people react, how they feel about their roles, how they listen to it. So, in a way, your methods, um, an approach to building a team, did that form the uh, the basis of how you could change people's attitudes to leadership within that setting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you need to cascade that because you can only work with a group of, in, in this manner, of, say, um, 15 people. Um, but they should be handpicked um, by the current leader um, as the emerging uh, leaders, not the usual suspects. Some usual suspects need to be mixed in because you, you can't have a wave of change uh, that doesn't get understood and accepted in the hierarchy. Um, so it, it is a very um, – the process of introducing change changes the culture. Okay. So let's see if you can take us through maybe the, the steps of the key methods. Could you describe those steps uh, to us? Well, look, the first thing is uh, in any setting you need – uh, the highest ranking person that you can get hold of uh, to be supporting the change that is going to be underway. And preferably, that person should be seen to be leading it um, and be receiving reports on progress and allowing next stages. Uh, this is hugely important because change is going into the unknown. It, uh, it always involves risk, and that requires two things. It requires um, optimism that the risks will be overcome um, and courage to actually implement risk. And so... Um, if people are looking over their back and thinking they're not going to be supported by their line manager uh, or their their chief, uh, you're not going to get the courage and you're not going to have the optimism. So that's the first thing to line up. And if possible, that should go right to the very top. So in Kazakhstan, it was the president who was saying change needs to happen. Uh, and the president had his own uh, very significant um, agenda for change. And so there was pressure on all the criminal justice arms to up their game significantly. Um, the different departments that we worked with um, uh, so when we worked with the prosecutor, the chief prosecutor led the whole thing. When we worked with the police, uh, the, the minister of the interior led the whole thing. Um, that is very important to get into play. It does mean that your, your pathfinders uh, are going to have to be very courageous. They don't know where the change is going to take them, and they're they've probably not come across the kind of methodology that we are providing. Secondly, the team 
the, so the change team that we talked about, um, that change team will, over time, morph into a change ball. Um, but it starts off in the, the thinking area of what change needs to accomplish, what where the resistances might be. And th they have the knowledge, and it's the wisdom of that group. And all you're doing is facilitating and doing it mentoring as they uh, go on on this journey. Um, the third thing is to cascade. Uh, big departments, uh, large geographical coverage, um, you have to have um, change agent, people who will um, be regularly updated, informed, and enthused about change evolving, and will be communicators, two-way communicators, going down the line on the what's being proposed and developed, and up the line on ideas, innovations line. Um, so we were dealing with over 5,000 prosecutors and for that we had uh, 50 change agents in the, um, the, the, the topic. Uh, and that was the minimum we could uh, do it with. Um, the, the change agents obviously got to be ones who are ready. Um, from there, you have to build up a strategic objective rather than uh, aspired change benefits they want. So, exactly what is that going to involve? Break that down to different projects. Try to get some early wins so that people can see that change is not. Uh, they can see the benefits materializing. Um, so, uh, in the, with the police in Kazakhstan, the uh, one early win was to change the training so that they, the people being trained as police, had um, a that was about how to relate to the public, and how to build public trust. Because um, they were basically being trained military style, um, Soviet military style. Uh, so you get your early wins, you've got a, a project, you need a project office, uh, which is uh, fully staffed internally. Um, that means there's got to be a shift of some resources into the chain uh, process. Um, that change office has got to monitor the projects, ensure that they're being managed appropriately, uh, and so on. And to use um, the fairly standard international techniques, and that I particularly use prints to um, find is very. Um, so by this stage, you've also moved the team, the change team, to be a change board, um, headed up by the most senior person you can get, uh, with a um, whole set of change procedures. Um, now, quite often in autocratic uh, authoritarian environments, no such thing as a board. Uh, it's individuals who make all decisions about everything. So even by saying that up, you're shifting the culture, how we make decisions, uh, um, how we delegate, how we hold people to account uh, in a different style altogether, much more healthy, um, engaging. So that that's basically the uh, the formula of the methodology. Okay, so let's look at how 
different, that is, for different types of uh, regime. I mean, you mentioned working uh, in an Arab con uh, a Middle Eastern context, but also uh, in a post-Soviet one. Um, it strikes me that it must be very enabling for uh, upcoming young, uh, very bright, younger middle management type of staff to have a chance to influence uh, their seniors if they've not had that chance before. Is it is it a, a way of releasing talent, your method? It absolutely is. And that's one of the great joys of it. Because you can see people really blossom and uh, excel in, in ways that they have not been able to before and haven't really recognised within themselves. So in Palestine... The starting point in Palestine was very problematic. Uh, because, um, everyone is living uh, in the occupied territory uh, with very constrained and vulnerable um, uh, family situation. Uh, loads of aggression had to be released before people could to work together. But the end point, uh, which is really, really interesting, where there was a, um, a day event for all the staff of the Ministry of Justice. And we had trained people to facilitate that. So we're not doing it, we're just watching. Um, the voice of the women was profound. Young women were actually um, the biggest contributors of the day. And, of course, the standard Arab culture um, doesn't really support that. Um, and they were confident, they were positive. Um, all, all of the staff uh, were uh, very um, kind of released to be um, of, of value, which means they felt valuable. So you're, yeah, so you're putting your principles into practice and in a way <clears throat> you were pioneering, um, but then the pioneering work, that team uh, becomes established within the department. That, 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 that ev evolution you, I, I now see very much why that can't be done in three months. It has to be, uh, I'm going to use the phrase, it has to be years for to win acceptance, not just from the top, but also throughout the department is, is the, the feel I'm getting. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So we worked for three years in Palestine um, and the job wasn't finished, uh, but we couldn't get any more funding. Um, and it, the, the other thing that, that you've got to do is you've, you've got to be influential to the big picture within which, in, in this case, Ministry of Justice operates, criminal justice system which operates in the Palestinian Authority civil service system. Uh, you've got to have some kind of shift taken in terms of the context within which uh, is operating. And so we built into this process will service um, a body, the, the centre, um, and they uh, adopted aspects of our change process um, and uh, so it, it kind of came fairly uh, acceptable and the Prime Minister came to our final event. Um, so you, people need to feel that this isn't going to go away. Now in practice, and 
generally difficult place to have any uh, stability for its reasons. Um, and there was a change of minister, the minister changed, and things slid back. Um, that's all it takes, getting um, the wrong person, the leader. And that time people get to be leaders, not because of merit, but because their, um, their track record supporting the board and the fight um, are not terribly good. Um, so you can't expect that the institutional change will um, survive, but actually the mindset change too. And I'm still in contact with five years later, more, um, who have changed their their jobs, styles, their um, expectations, and they are definitely the next generation of leaders. Mm. Okay, let's change the focus a little bit and uh, use your uh, learning to ask what the, you think the biggest challenges to overcome are in international development work. Um, firstly, the commission. So the, the brief you get, uh, the level of funding and the timing is completely uh, disconnected from the realities often. Um, so uh, I suppose I, I should have said what one of the things, preparation for a, going out into an assignment, is actually to try and get a good relationship with the commissioner because you're going to want to change the brief. And the five things are different. Um, so the, the, the problem is that um, quite often they don't have the understanding. Uh, they're looking for quick fixes, uh, and there's no such thing. Um, secondly, the political dynamics around the world are pretty appalling. Um, green writers, writers and uh, left um, <sighs> roles of uh, dictators, um, powering of the judiciary, um, just you know, general or daring. Um, that's a very difficult environment to um, help societies make progress. Um, but it's probably the most important time and reason for making progress. So you're not one of those people that says, um, I'm not going to go to that uh, country um, because it's too extreme. You think you should go in and, and engage with what exists. Absolutely, I do. Um, so I have had people I've invited into countries saying, I'm not coming because their human rights record is falling. Um, I mean, how do you get change and improvement uh, if you just walk away? Um, however, it, you've got to be realistic. So there's not many leaders who want to be right at the bottom of the international tables in terms of a human rights. Yeah. Um, or corruption. They don't particularly want that because it's not going to, they may be participating in, in it, but they want to uh, have international investment and uh, better status and standing, most of all. Um, so you work with what you've got and where the scope for finding change benefits that uh, trigger leadership, uh, interest and motivation. And there's always something. Mm. Do you have an analysis of where 
consultancy falls short in working overseas on justice issues? Um, over dependence on uh, technical inputs. So there's very little done on, on the systems. Um, there's an awful lot of training, um, which, uh, as I said before, if you don't change the system, the new training practices and understandings, then it's just going to be a frustration and get into virtually nowhere. Um, it, it's also problematic in terms of the uh, secrecy and the security issue uh, around law enforcement, um, which is uh, quite difficult to gain uh, trust and openness to be able to get under the, under the skin, get proper engagement um, and enable um, developments. Uh, but uh, it's doable. It's mm. so in um, you know social pioneers operation was the very first to be given access right across Kazakhstan to law enforcement officials and um, operations. Uh, they did scrutinise the CVs of everybody involved. <laughs> it's fine. Absolutely fine. Google. How do you think we can develop better change leaders? Um, I, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. And I, I think it's important to get networking between leaders and emerging leaders and aspiring leaders. Um, that are not uh, bound by a particular discipline or professional area, but that there is a rip uh, area of cross fertilization of what works, where the headaches are, how to get people on side, because there's lots of lots of common ground. Um, at the moment, there is a tendency for the leaders to be located in one particular domain, talking only to those leaders in that domain. Secondly, mentoring. Um, uh, I think mentoring is a very key way forward. Um, so leaders have been done that. Um, uh, enabling others to um, steer their course of, of development. There are aspects of training, um, but it's in, in my first two are about personal um, engagement, connectivity, support. Uh, and that, I think, it gives people the, uh, the richness of of understanding realities and the confidence of doing things differently. Mm. Sounds to me like you're a bit wary of specialists taking their specialism and imposing it on another country. <laughs> yes, um, definitely. But what, when people are confronting the, the need to change, no change, not an option. They have to change. First thing they want to do is find a comparator who's been there um, and gone through this journey, and we can follow that. That's the safest thing. But life isn't like that. Uh, every every change program has its own particular set of uh, circumstances, and who. So, they ask to go and see someone uh, or some department or some prison or something that's done what they are now aspiring to do. And what they can see is something that has similarities 
but it's not the same. Um, so you, you have a situation where um, you have you, the the shape of the uh, the shape and the pace of change must be formed. The wisdom of the people involved and who are stakeholders, um, but they need to be able to draw upon other uh, areas of comparison. But posing this is international best practice. Uh, this is the way you should do it. Um, no, not a good idea. Mm. Do you have? Would you have advice for people thinking about international development work or ab about to go overseas? Um, firstly, it's never been more important. We're all interconnected, and we know it now deeply um, in, in every aspect of life. Uh, what happens in one corner of the globe can absolutely be uh, destructive um, in another. So with climate change, pandemics, um, food shortages, uh, terrorism, whatever you want to mention. So we need to help raise the game wherever we own and um, secondly, um, recognize that you're going to be meeting people who have not got the, uh, have not been exposed to the experiences uh, and understandings that you've got, and some of which will help, and some of which won't be appropriate. And you've got to uh, be delicate in, in that. Largely what you're trying to do is get them to understand that they have actually very, they have common concerns and ideals. Um, and to identify those, unify around them. It's a facilitating mentoring role, not a telling. So uh, with with that in mind, um, so you can enrich their understandings. You don't tell them what they will do. Um, you guide and help navigate the journey of change. Yes, it, it needs quite a lot of confidence, though, doesn't it? If you, for example, are running a project in a country where you're relatively new, um, you might feel a bit lonely. Um, you know, haven't worked out where your allies are. Um, my guess is falling back on telling people what to do is um, a bit of an automatic reflex, isn't it? Or, you know, how <laughs> how while you're there, how can you uh, avoid falling back into the consultant stereotype? Um, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It is. Uh, very exposed, pretty lonely, um, it's new territory for yourself and for your customer. Um, uh, you've got to have some gravitas um, to be able to deal uh, as high up the ladder as you possibly can get. Um, but that does mean that frequently asked for um, advice or, or decisions very <clears throat> quickly. Like, uh, I, I, I mean, last um, by the chief prosecutor, how many staff do I need to have in the change program office? And I thought, can't go away and work it out. I'll just pull the figure out of the air. Um, I mean, it wasn't the right figure either, but it was a starting point. <laughs> um, so you do have to be absolutely on, on your toes. The issue about um, basically fallback position of um, 
telling people uh, this is what you have to do. It, it is part of your rules. You just never, ever do that. And if you find yourself doing it, you scold yourself. Uh, you just, oh, I wish I didn't, I didn't say that. Um, my technique involves training the translators to be facilitated. So the language issue comes up doing everything translator. The translator, um, by nature, is an enabler, a communicator, not, um, not a, a manager. Uh, and a authority, um, and so they, their style is really um, appropriate. Um, it's good to be having this uh, training as part of the legacy leaving behind. Um, so the more you put in the hands of local people, the better. It's interesting because it strikes me that facilitation and engagement are absolute key to crossing over the cultural issues, um, which are at the heart of change and um, intriguing how the interpreter, because they're often young, uh, extremely bright, uh, how they can be pivotal in lots of settings uh, and are you suggesting they can also correct correct some errors if you put your foot in it oh um, they do <laughs> we hope so anyway yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay uh, yeah so okay let's um ask a, a question as we're getting towards the end of our time what have been your top three resources while you've been abroad what are your go-to methods um, well, there are two that stand out. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll let one, you off with two. Because <laughs> uh, it's base, basically a methodology. And then you, you need um, a couple of uh, appropriate approaches, um, tools. So the, I, I go to the ICA-UK. So if you Google ICA, you'll come up with everything from arts to ice cream. Um, so it's ICA-UK, specialise in consensus building. So they have a consensus workshop model that I find used it in the UK with senior civil servants. Uh, I've used it all over the place. It is really powerful. Um, they also have other tools, um, like how to have informative conversations. But you can be in cultures where people have been disencouraged talking to each other. Uh, that's certainly a Soviet nation. Um, so you're asking them to sort of... Uh, inform and consult with their colleagues about change. They don't know how to do it. So ICA UK have got all of the spectrum of models and concepts. The second, I'm afraid, is a bit more um, esoteric. I own a theory of leadership, um, which I have uh, been working on for decades. Um, and what, and it's quite different to most of the leadership literature because it's about all's leadership. You are trying to make social change, deliver the best quality public services. Cause there. Nearly all the literature is about your ambition and uh, your earnings uh, and going up the hierarchy, da, da, da. This is quite different. And it has four quadrants of a sphere. 
um, the, and these are the four outcomes that uh, I look for in myself and in other leaders. Um, the first one is objective. The outcome is to get an agreement on a set of strategic objectives on which change. Second one is um, order, that there is a process for change that is uh, friendly to change. It's an enabling process, whereas quite a lot, if you don't process, block change. Uh, the third one is opportunities, uh, opportunities to come from people and networks um, and who you involve in teams and uh, all the rest of it. Uh, how, how you engage with stakeholders and with staff. Uh, and the final one is optimal. This is the hard stuff because the risks are pretty high. So people need to see as much reassurance as possible. We've got the right skills, we've got the right approach, we've got the right plans, uh, we've got the right resources capable of doing this. Um, so you've got to uh, address gaps in that, otherwise nothing else is going to work. Hope, hope is very important, isn't it? Uh, tra travel, travel with hope in your heart is uh, it, is rather important. Um, we're. I want you to look to the future. How do you see leadership changing in the next phase of development? Um, I think that leadership has to be much more joined up. Look at the big, big issues um, like climate change. Um, everything that happened makes a positive or negative contribution in terms of the environment. Uh, so, for instance, the um, person who was leading on the sustainability goals for the United Nations has um, set up an operation that's about um, the food supply chain and nutrition. Seeing that agriculture, trees, uh, the method of creating food and the choices of people Take eating meat or whatever um, need to be focused on getting the right nutrition at the same time as being environmentally sound and friendly. That's joining things up, but working across previous silos. Um, so it, it's uh, one globe thinking that I think is going to be extremely important. What is my impact uh, in the way that I'm leading on issues that are not directly in my control? Um, second is uh, that it clearly le leadership is going to be rooted um, more locally. So there's the um, whole uh, concern about international uh, work being um, colonial coming in from the, uh, the the rich west to go into the poor south uh, and the growth of local leadership rooted in their own culture is going to be fundamentally important and there's got to be some enablers for that. Um won't just uh, so there's quick in and out international technical stuff um will uh, be less of uh, uh, of an approach. It'll still be relevant, but you could just as easily get someone from Africa coming and 
advising on primary care in, in Britain. There's a lot more mutuality than we actually um, allow. Okay. I'm going to give you the last word, Bill. Um, what continues to excite you about uh, the role of the independent consultant? Um, it's hugely satisfying when you see lives change. And that's the approach methodology that I'm talking about, change lives. The direct form, those you engage with, uh, and the indirectly about where they take their, their new understandings and some uh, optimism, but they take that in their own families. So that is really it really exciting um the, the other thing is is actually feeling that there is a groundswell of public awareness um that is going to become unstoppable uh because it is actually uh unforgiving about the failures of current leaders um in terms of levels of corruption, um, human rights abuses, uh, suppression of minorities, all the bad stuff. And I think that uh, one is, is feeding the examples of right um, and putting them on pedestals. And as, as, so that is also, I think it's part of a a real social movement. Mm. And that the good women and the good men end up being the leaders of the future. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to sign off now. Thank you very much, Bill, for sharing your uh, life and work with us. Uh, please, everybody out there, um, remember that there are going to be reference materials online on the INCJ website. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe, and I hope that you can join us next time. Goodbye and thank you. Podcasts are available on your normal provider via iTunes and Google under INCJ Podcasts. You have been listening to the INCJ Podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.